All right, so a couple of things. Uh, let's see. So I did this presentation in Bulgaria a couple of weeks ago, and it was a Java conference, so I figured I'd throw this slide up because they invited me, they paid me for me to come all the way over there, and the first slide they see is Cambrian Explosion, so I said, you know, don't panic, you know. It really is a presentation about Java. But you don't look like the panicking type, so. But I figured I'd leave the slide in there, and, and the Vogon, just in case. Uh, so. Um, so here's who I am. I'm John M. Willis.com. I've been pretty much, I, I'm 30 years I've been doing IT infrastructure, and, and I have this kind of, you know, I'm an operations guy. IT infrastructure, operations, that's what I do. So we're like locusts. Like every 17 years it gets really freaking exciting. You know, um, and it was about maybe 17, 20 years ago when mainframes switched to distributing, it got really exciting, and then it stayed boring for quite a while. And then about three years ago, operations became phenomenally exciting again. And I, I sold my company. I did Tivoli Consulting and Enterprise, and I'm like, I got to get involved in this new open source and, and what turned out to be cloud. So for the last three years, I've been really focusing on this, this cloud space and really thinking about the operational side of it, you know, how, what, there's all these fabulous things that, that people are doing, and, and a lot of you guys in this room are doing it. Um, you know, how, what is the operational, what is the new data center going to look like, whether it's small or huge, right? So, um, so anyway, so um, I do a podcast with uh, Red Monk, um, with IT management guys. We're like the car guys, but we talk about IT management and cloud, so we cut up. And I'm bacha galoop just about everywhere else. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work. I do, right now I'm doing some work for Canonical, helping them launch their uh, Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud, which is really Eucalyptus. And uh, so I keep hearing I, these really smart people I keep running into, and we keep hearing everybody say, the people who get, get it, what's going on right now, say things like we're in a, you know, a new type of industrial revolution, or I've heard the, the, the steam of the Cambrian explosion of IT infrastructure. So I, I really started thinking about this, you know, and, and, and um, and it really, I was really kind of going back, because I really haven't, you know, I set the stage. I've been an ops guy. I, didn't, I wasn't thinking about five years ago what most of you guys were thinking about. So I went back and I actually, kind of as an analyst or a journalist, I tried to figure out what the heck is happening. All right, I'm accepting the fact that there's clearly, put it this way, when a guy like me can take performance data and run Hive with MapReduce and get meaningful data, it's a Cambrian explosion. Because I'm not a rocket scientist, you know. Um, you know, I look at guys like Brad, and I'm honored to honestly be up here. That, that you know, like, I don't do that kind of stuff. You know, I don't write Erlang code. I, I think I'd like to, but, but the thing is, is the bottom line. We've gotten to the point where average Joes, we're really close. I'm going to end this story with Flightcaster if you haven't heard that, right? And and Flightcaster's got a model there where. I don't say average shows, but the average guy on the street, the average guy being an oceanographer or a, right, can actually use a DSL that turns that abstracts into phenomenal technology. And doesn't have to know a darn thing about Java, Hadoop, cascading, you know, pig, anything, right? So 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 this is you know, I think we're in that kind of IT Cambridge. You know, I, I, like I said, I kept hearing people talk about the Industrial Revolution or and I've got some cool quotes here from people that are that have said things like, you know, 40 years ago and things people are saying now. So one of the guys who said something about 50 years ago is this guy, Herbert Simon, who, in my research, right, so he has this kind of theory of hierarchy and componentization, and this pretty much nails it. I just call it, I like to make things easy. I call it like unbelievable abstraction or abstraction of infrastructure or everything's like this really, flight caster is an abstraction of top, abstraction on top of abstraction. Right? But this guy says, you know, he ran a Nobel Prize, right? So he says it a lot better than me. He says, the rate of evolution of any system is dependent upon the organization of its subsystem. That's it, right? Think about, you know, all the stuff that's gone on and where we are now, right? It's, it's you know, really cool. Is anybody excited yet? Big data. No? Okay. All right. So, oh, that's right. We're not allowed to do that. Got to be tough questions, right? So, but this one's really cool. There's a video out on YouTube of Hal Varian. He's the chief economist for Google, and it is a spectacular video. And he talks about a period of combinatorial innovation, you know, and, and like this happened in, in the uh, 1800s with interchangeable parts, rifles, guns, right? They figured out how to kind of mass produce based on other people making parts. It happened again in the 20s 
with electronics. It happened in the 70s with integrated circuits, and it's happening now in, um, in this kind of Cambrian explosion of IT infrastructure. And so I kind of took all these ideas that everybody did, and I kind of took you know, a lot of, and I sat down and I said, what are the kind of four factors that they're all saying, and, and I believe too, that, that's like making this thing go nuts? You know, the stuff we're seeing, the, the flight casters, the, the, the ability for um, you know, people to throw up the genome database on Amazon and have students like playing with it, right? Um, Right, so um, so I, I kind of put it into four categories, and I'll go through each of these. Abstract and fault-tolerant components, the, the seemingly, the, the, seem, the idea that it seems like you have unlimited infrastructure. I need 10, I get it. I need 100, I get it. Um, a worldwide collaboration, right, um, and we'll talk about that. That's a big factor here, right, that, you know, somebody over in uh, Tokyo is working with somebody in, in Chicago, and they're doing phenomenal things together which, you know, five years ago, they probably never would have met. You know, people make fun of Twitter. I love Twitter. You know, I, I go to, you know, I go to Bulgaria, and, you know, some guy who follows me on Twitter says, hey, you want to come to my house for dinner? Yeah, that's cool. Uh, changes in intellectual property. So the abstract of fault tolerant is that, you know, if you, that interchangeable parts, our interchangeable parts are abstract. They're software. They're bits. They're virtual. Right, so that kind of adds to this explosion that they're really easy to put together. I mean, well, they're hard to put together for developers, but for consumers like me, they're actually pretty easy. Um, you know, so I, I can, you know, here, you take one, you take one. Oh, you need two just in case? Good. Right, they're clustered, or they can be clustered. Right, which leads us to this kind of fault tolerance, right? So you know what, take three just in case. You know, put one here, put one here, put one here. Um, and by the way, you know what, why don't all five of you guys work on it at the same time? Right, so, um, so, that, so that's that kind of, and then the unlimited infrastructure is we never run out. You know, where's my, uh, the guy who snuck out of my cloud camp last night, right, there he is, uh, Animoto, right? That's the greatest story ever, right? It's overhyped, it's been told a billion times, but and it's like the old football player story too, like so, you know, it started out with 40 to 1,000, then it was 40 to 2,000. Then, you know, I hear people go, yeah, you know, Animoto went from, you know, 40 to 10,000 in a week, you know, so uh, servers, that is, or virtual instances. But I think, what's the number, 3,500? Is that, is it 40 to 3,500? So, something like that, right? But, boy, is that unlimited or what? Right? I mean, the fact that, you know, that, you know, I remember giving a presentation once to like this Python group on cloud computing, and they're all sitting there like, these are hardened sysadmins. They're just, you know, they're like, yeah, cloud, you know, oh, cloud, yeah. And I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fire up 10 Amazon instances. And I, I was just like wondering if it was going to have any effect because these guys see servers all the time, big deal, right? But when I fired up the 10 and I went in and I shelled into one, everyone in the room was like, whoa, that's pretty cool. You know, it was like that difference between, yeah, server's a server's a server, but the fact that I'm sitting on my laptop and I started 10 and I shelled into it, and it's, we don't know where it is. That was really cool. So you can duplicate them, um, you can reproduce them. The collaboration, right, this is obvious. We got, we got hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people working on projects together that may never meet in a lifetime, right? So. Um, so, you know, the components are available for everybody. You know, somebody starts a project here, and we've got people around the world, students in Indonesia, are basically getting involved in the open source project, because it's cool. Now, this is cool. I, I just threw this in. So, I'm on a, um, since I've been consulting for Canonical, I get these really weird uh, mailing list things. So, so, it was labeled, the greatest Nagios alert ever. See it? That, it's a, it's a check of running out of the Conical Turk funds, right? So, I mean, I thought that was, you know, perfect, right? You know, for a worldwide collaboration, right? So, a mechanical Turk, right? So, I was trying to explain to somebody, now what we need to do, so we kind of went to automation, then we actually go into people automation, now we got to figure out how to automate the mechanical Turk back to computer. So, I, you know, I don't know, it's getting crazy. Changes in intellectual property, right? So, clearly open source, right? That's added a lot to the, this explosion, right? So the people who are ah, open source, I don't get it. You know, well, you know, where do you get your computer resources from? Right, because, you know, uh, Google, Amazon, 
you know, Rackspace, you know, <laughs> they're all building primarily on top of open source, right? You know, you know, almost all the things that are exciting um, are happening because of open source, you know, you know, hypervisor technology, Zen and, and KVM, right? I mean, those things, you know, you can't ignore. But that's not just it. It's that um, also that a dope like me, you could tell me, I know nothing about NeoJ. Don Brown, right, is here. He said, you got to, NeoJ is like the coolest thing ever. It's unbelievable. Jeez, I got to add another thing to the list to figure out, right? So, so I'm like, you know, but the thing is, is if I actually sat down and had the time today, or I sit the presentation, but if I wasn't going to go to the presentation, I, I could Google it. I could probably, you know, I'm not really a dope, right? I can reasonably intelligent be about it. And maybe there's some guy that actually did a step-by-step -step how to install it that blogged about it, that, and then some other guy who like corrected his six step where, oh, you know, Joe's blog is excellent except at sec, step six, make sure you do this. Right, so we're all just, it's not even, so that's intellectual property, it's just where, you know, I did this blog post for Canonical, how to install a private cloud in an hour. And it's a step by step, you know, bulletproof, again, if I can do it, anybody can do it. You know, and that's out there now, you know, and, and you know, so uh, Mark Shuttleworth yelled at me and said it should have brought, it should have been 15 minutes, you know. So, but what are you gonna do? So big data, right? So, um, so what is this big data, right? So most of you, you know, are developers. For you, you know, I, I the, the whole big data thing, people either fall into two categories. For I like tell, they're like, no S, well, no SQL. So no SQL, I don't get it. Okay, well, what don't you get? Well, you no, know, and SQL, you know. And then the other group is the, you know, the hardened racial database people like, come on. Now I'm gonna put up your dukes. You know, what are you telling me? You're gonna get rid of you're gonna get rid of Oracle? It ain't gonna happen. You know, it's just it's like the, you know, two or three years ago it was the big switch of computing. So you go to an enterprise, you say, Have you heard about cloud computing? Not gonna happen here. Absolutely no. There's no way we're gonna move our credit card data to the cloud. Well, that's not the way it's gonna work. It, you know, I say that it's a dimmer switch, it's not the big switch. Parts of, you know, I, I talk to CIOs and CTOs and they tell me, we're not using Amazon. And I'm like, well, did you see the blog here from one of your guys that's actually did a marketing campaign using Amazon? All right, so, it's a, you know, I think this NoSQL is, I think it was a great name to put a stake in around and get a lot of people excited and, you know, everybody kicking everybody in the shins. But, but um, it, you know, the bottom line is it's not an either or, it's not binary, right? It's, I had a great conversation with somebody last night about you know how he's using Oracle and he's using Voldemont and he's thinking about doing Cassandra I and mean, it was just brilliant. It's exactly how, the way it needs to be explained when people are like, we're not going to know what's go. It ain't going to happen. Well, it's it's not a it's not an either or. It's like he was explaining like for this use case, this worked great with with Voldemont. And then there was another guy who was a Cassandra guy. And he's like, well, you should use Cassandra, and they were explaining that. And then he had other stuff that was never going to leave Oracle. Right? That's the way it really is. It's it's that. And I, to me, not being like a really a big data, but more of a big data analyst, right? And to me, it's like, you know, the beauty of this stuff that I get is the unstructured structured nature of it, right? Is that I start off way back. I don't have to start thinking about columns and tables and designing for a relational database. I may end up there, but where I start is, I, I, it, like, it's, a, it's a white board, right? It's like, okay, the options, you know, before the options were, no matter what we're going to do, we're going to wind up going to that relational database. Now it's like, okay, I, can, I, I don't have to think that way. I can start off and not make some assumptions. I can think use case first. Thank you, Brad. Brad actually helped me a lot on this presentation. We went over and gave me some great ideas, including premature optimization is the root of all evil. I love it. Right? So uh, another old timer, right? Um, but, you know, so we don't have to make these, like, decisions about optimizing database on day one. So for me, I started in 1978. I know I look a lot younger, but uh, in 1978, I was the guy chosen to do backups on the IBM mainframe in the computer club that we had in high school. Right? So that was my first stint in this thing. My first job was at Exxon. And I actually worked on one of these monsters in operations. And, uh, and it, was, it was, I don't know if you've ever seen these things. They're, they're called 3850s. Each one of those little honeycombs is like a little, and they, they actually would spin these things off to real 3330 disks. 
So somebody make a request for a file, this like ridiculous arm of a, a rack of these honeycombs this long would go and find that little stupid thing, spin it down, so anything would break like every five minutes. Cones would get smashed, oh, it was just a nightmare. But we, for that, all that fun and excitement, we paid $20 million for 500 gig. Right? You know this story, right? I can get that 500 gig for 50 bucks right now. So that's, this is where I've been. <laughs> you know, you know, so, um, so why is big data happening, right? Uh, you, know, you know, think about what some of the stuff you guys are doing. It just wasn't possible. <laughs> I mean, uh, even, you know, now that the, you know, the, the, the storage space is like ridiculously um, commoditized. But, you know, and we've got everything else. Hey, the Cambrian solution. So, all right, so here's my history lesson. I'm, I was reluctant to do this in front of a bunch of people that probably know a lot more about this stuff than I do, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm not going to vouch for the, if this is the exact history that happened. So, um, but here's the deal. So I went back and I was like, okay, how did we get to this place where, where I think we're going to have this phenomenal explosion, this abstraction of really cool things being in place where just anybody can run MapReduce without even knowing they're doing MapReduce, right? How do, how, how do we get here? And, and so I went back and I looked. In fact, I started with a nice presentation from, from Red Hat from a guy who was, um, might be in this room, Project Hale. You know, he had some notes about, you know, that, that like in the um, late 90s or 80s, people started taking this idea of the Paxos algorithms, this kind of eventual timely links um, there's Eric Brewer's um, CAP theorem, right? Um, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, right? So, so you, you can only get two of the three. Thank you again, Brad. <laughs> um, the, um, but the, the thing is, is so, so here's the way I put it together, right? So Google is sitting there with one server and 26 million URLs, and they're thinking, you know, this is going to get crazy. So we've got two ways to solve this problem. One is we can just keep buying really honking big machines. We get Sun to come in and give us the, replace the 50K one with the 100K one. And then when that gets too big, we'll buy the $250,000 one. And, and then, you know, and then we'll have to then go to IBM and get the million dollar ones. And, you know, and, you know, is that going to work? Probably not. So what are we going to do? We're going to have to change the way we do this. You know, why don't we like say, all right, instead of the hardware getting it right, Let's not worry about the hardware. Let's make the software get it right. Right? And so that's where this stuff like this kind of, um, you know, and, and from my research, Microsoft actually did some landmark, landmark papers on kind of using Paxos algorithms and all that. And um, from what I've read, Google kind of picked up on that, like when they're trying to figure out, okay, how do we go through this phenomenal growth rate that looks like we're going on, and how do we do this? And they started doing that internal, right? And then they published some papers about Google file system, their MapReduce algorithms, big table. And guess what? At the same time, Amazon's trying to figure out how to deal with this same problem. And they kind of build a model from some of that, from some of uh, the CAP theorem. You know, there's the white paper on uh, Dynamo, right? This S3, eventual consistency. Sound a lot like eventual timely links, right? Same thing. This kind of new way to cluster lots of machines and get this kind of fault tolerance and commodity hardware. There's a great article recently by somebody figured out what kind of machines and what the cost is that Amazon's doing. You know, and they, you know, on average, it looked like they were running $2,000 machines. Lots of them. You know, and then obviously the, the Yahoo folk, right, did some phenomenal stuff by looking at what, you know, what the white paper stuff that, um, that not Amazon, that, that Google is doing about MapReduce decided to do it in, you know, in Java. I always get a kick there, right? So, so I figure this guy, was it um, Doug Cutting or whatever, he's sitting there, right? You know, just brilliant guy trying to figure out with Java and JVM how to do this parallelization and all this stuff, all based on this white paper. He's like, okay, what do I name this thing? And his daughter walks in and says, Dad, did you see my stuffed elephant? Got it, Hadoop, you know? So, uh, but I, I think that it could have been worse, right? Because it could have been like, you know, imagine we're doing like uh, massively parallel analytics on Dumbo. You know, so that wouldn't have been cool. So it might have been okay. Cloud Era, um, the uh, Cloud Era, obviously, what they've done with Hadoop. Again, you make it easy for guys like me to to actually kick the tires on something like Hadoop, right? You know, so you know, just a couple of years ago, I, we have a, a you know uh, Brad and, and and Don Brown, a local kind of Hadoop experts, or 
And, and you know, so I, what a client, actually, Chris Curtin was given a presentation today, had called me and said, hey, do we have anybody that knows Hadoop? This is before Cloud Era produced all this stuff, right? And I'm like, well, I know, you know, Don Brown, you know, he's local, he's, you know, he's done some projects already. And I hooked them up, and they spent a whole lot of time just getting Hadoop configured at the shop, like a year ago. Right? As soon as they finished, Cloud Air announced it all, all done and free, and, and you know, then turns around, Amazon introduced another one. You know, so, I mean, they spent a lot of time on that project just configuring it, right? So, uh, so, so today, you know, so my job is to pump you up. I don't know if, if you're like saying, get this guy off the stage or what, but you know, I got to see some excitement here because it's, it's big data, guys, come on. But so these are all, like, we're going to see presentations from all these people, right? And, and most of the people are going to present, probably all of them are brilliant people. But one of the things I will say is they suck at picking names. You know, these are like ridiculously bad names. So smart people, bad name choices. So, all right, so here's where I'm going to add some value to you today, right? So up to now, I'm just a talking head, right? But um, I'm going to help you decide or, or go through some of the decisions that some of these people are making about, you know, what tools should they use? Right? It's hard, right? I mean, with a lot of choices. Do I use, like, Voldemort? Do I use, I don't know, you know, right? So here, I'm going to nail it for you. So the dig guy, he's got to figure out, should he use Voldemort? Or should he use Cassandra? Easy choice. I'll take the beautiful redhead every time. So, so that, was, that was a pretty easy one. So piece of cake, right? Well, now, our good friends Cloud Ant, right, they had a choice, too. They're going to work long hours working on a really cool um, kind of sharing database, you know, text documentation, cloudish cool thing. What do they do? Do they go at late nights, go lay down with this ugly dude? Well, they sit in a nice Art Deco couch, right? They, they chose, you know, they chose CouchDB over MongoDB. So again, I think the decisions are really easy. Now, Yahoo is a little bit more difficult for those guys because they had to decide in, in kind of go into this Mount Everest of producing like phenomenal stuff. Should they pick, bring this guy along? Or, you know, should they get, you know, somebody to help them climb that mountain? And interestingly enough, they chose both. Right, so uh, pig and Sherpa, right, so good stuff, good. You're killing me, people. All right, so, uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so back to reality, I'm almost done. Um, I love the, you know, the, the Jim Gray sort. How many people have seen the Jim Gray sort with Hadoop, right? It, you know, it's killer, right? So and, and I'm using a little literary license here, but what the heck. Um, so, so each year, like, you know, MIT would win. So it's a, it's, they used to have a, they have different levels, but they are one terabyte sort, right? So MIT would win, University of Tokyo would win, MIT would win, and the Hadoop guys came to town, right? And they kind of blew the doors off in the first year, right, 2008, right? They, they built a 910 node cluster, and uh, they, you know, they knocked it almost down, you know, by a minute and a half, right? So, cool. So the next year they come back, and they do so well with a 1400, node cluster, this is a sort, it's one terabyte sort, so uh, 10, 10 byte, 100 byte records, right? And, uh, and they blow the doors at it, they have to actually rename the, 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 the contest. They rename it to the minute sort instead of the terabyte sort. In fact, to make it even worse, they figured just for grins, we're gonna submit this other one we did, even though there's not a category for it, with a 3500 node cluster of 100 terabytes. How do you like that? And so they're like, well, geez, Jim Gray, who founded this thing, he's dead. Let's go ahead and call it the Jim Gray sort, right? So pretty cool. I mean, to, to me, that's a, a kind of a benchmark of, you know, this is, this is crazy stuff. Um, I, one of the gentlemen I spoke tonight works for Rackspace, talking about what they're doing with Cassandra. He's going to be speaking. Um, to me, a great story for a Hadoop story was the, the Rackspace mail trust guys, right? So they, they start off with, you know, some number of mail servers and, and the traditional operational way, to, and this is where I get excited when, when your world crosses my world in operations, right? So, you know, so they, the, the traditional thing was you know, something goes wrong, customer calls, they log in and they shell in and they try to figure it out, right? Well, they grow to 300, 400 servers, that's ridiculous. So then they start to pull all the stuff back. There's a great blog article about this. They pull it all back to MySQL so that they can run reports to figure out everything that's going on. Well, that worked until they got up to about 400 servers. So then they said, well, should we use, um, you know, should we use Splunk? 
And they said, you know what, we're just going to go for gold, let's use Hadoop. So they used Hadoop, they started getting all that data, they run MapReduce jobs every night and all this. And what they found once they went there, and this is a common theme of everybody I talked to, is that the unstructured nature of it was that not only did they, were they answering like really cool questions, but when questions came up that in the past were like, you know, get out of my face. They were like, hey, I think we can do that. And one of their early ones was they were actually, uh, they actually had this like um, database that they paid a subscription model for. Every month they got um, kind of an IP to region in the world thing. And they're like, I wonder if we'd like merge that in with the Hadoop jobs. And they're like, wow, yeah, and they, bang, it was real easy. They didn't have to go get, you know, Oracle BI experts to come in and, you know, redesign everything. This unstructured native, sure, is Chris Curtin here? All right, I'm going to steal just a little bit of thunder from his presentation, just a teeny bit. Chris Curtin has a killer presentation from Silverpop about how he's kind of switched from uh, Oracle BI to Hadoop, and he's killing it, like Brad said, just killing it, right? So, but to me, the greatest story, and if he tells it to you or not, he'll just, um, don't tell him I told you, right? So, um, but to me, is so he, he switched all over, and he's going to tell you how he did that. He's going to show you code of what he's used. He used cascading. It's very cool. But one of the things that happens is they do these um, email marketing campaigns. And so they, they, they switched this up. They were doing this campaign for this customer. And the customer came. And now they're running like Hadoop for this stuff. And the customer said, and said you know, hey, you know, that last game we did, we have all these users that you know, we gave you. And it, we, you, it was great that you told us between 18 and 25, they responded this amount of time, between 25 and 30. It took. But what if we could add in their Delta Frequent Flyer status? And, um, and, and Crystal says in the presentation I saw, it's like, you know, that would have been like, get lost. You know, get out of my office. You know, it would have been like, bring in the BI guys. I always say the BI guys are like, like whenever I move, you know, I, 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 I hate lifting stuff and moving stuff. So I go out and I find a really good moving company. And what always happens is the movers come in and they're monster guys. I mean, big, big guys. And the first time they got to pick up the washing machine, they start whining like little girls. You know, this is real heavy. You know, at least you can get the door for me. I was like, dude, that's why I hired you. I was like the BI guys. The first thing they're going to go is you start telling them that you've got to integrate Delta Fly. They go, oh, my goodness. You know, we're paying you like 400 bucks an hour. Oh, jeez, I don't know. This is going to be so hard to change the database, you know. And you, 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 you argue with them for like, you know, three weeks. Then you do change. And, you know, three months later, you get the simple change. When he used the dupe and he integrated, in his words, it was a couple hour change and a day and a half turnover. You know, that's the beauty of this kind of data, is that you can integrate stuff. Then you can start thinking like completely out of the box. Right? You know, oh, wow, sure. I think we can do that real easy. You know, this kind of, um, so I think those are good stories. And then, so I'll end up with the Flightcaster story. How many people have heard about Flightcaster? Yeah, a handful, right? So I, I did a cloud, I do a cloud cafe podcast. And when I heard this, I was like, you know, got to get this guy on the phone, got to talk to him. So, um, so it's like a Y Combinator, right? It's like a couple of developers, and in three months, right, they develop this thing that basically predicts air delays up to like 88% or high 80%, right? And so what they do is, and this is, the, this is the Cambrian explosion at its core. This is abstraction at its core. And that is that, um, so they went ahead and they take data from anything that moves or breathes um, flight stuff. Just about done. Uh, and um, so they take data from the FAA, from airports, from just anything, weather, anything. And they pull it in. It's all like really in perfect format too, right? No, right? It's like unstructured. Who knows? All the different formats. They use Cloudera Hadoop. And then they use cascading to abstract Hadoop. So they have these layers of that. The people that work, you know, ultimately the people that work with this stuff who use cascading really won't know, know a whole lot about Hadoop. Because if you've seen cascading, it's a great, to me, to put it in simple terms, it makes Hadoop like a, look like a big old sort program. But only does really fantastic parallelism and all that kind of stuff. And then, to even get better, they took Clojure, and they got two values out of Clojure. For Clojure, they kind of built a DSL, a domain-specific language, on top of cascading, so that now they can actually turn over to like people who might know weather or flight and all that stuff and not have need to know anything about cascading to ask questions. Right? And, and then Clojure, because it's list-based, worked phenomenal for parsing data. And then, you know, to add um, 
um, salt on a wound, if you think in Cambrian, is that they put their web interface up on Heroku, which is a Ruby on Rails platform as a service. Bang. I mean, this is three month effort, couldn't have been more than a half million dollar investment. And I'll say this, I don't think that they could have done this three to five years ago because there probably was only a couple of places on the planet where they could have processed the type of data that they're processing. You know, now, you know, anybody. In fact, I want to make a recommend to them, to them. I want to go ahead and have them augment it to predict um, what flight would be, give me the bo best of possibility of giving an upgrade, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so every time I fly, you know, list me the ones where I have the best option for getting upgraded. So, uh, so who else but the Cambrian dude to end the thing? That's it.